Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online service. It's awesome to have you with us. We're looking forward to a great service today. Our team is about to lead us in a time of worship. We actually have Pastor James uh, speaking a little bit later on. We're just about to start. church. Come on in. Stand up. Let's get ready for worship today, eh? Yeah! We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We'll shout out. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to ask all of our students to just make your way real quick up to the front. As you may or may not know, by seeing those school buses out at the front, we're leaving for camp in like 10 minutes. Come on up, guys. If you're coming to camp, if you're a parent of a student going to camp, just make your way up here. Stretch out all the way that way, because there's a lot of us. So you guys can just go that way. We just want to bless these guys, amen? We believe that this is a big moment of spiritual impact. We want to see the Holy Spirit do a mighty work in these kids' lives. We want to see them come back changed, making decisions to devote their lives to Jesus for all the days of their lives. 
and uh, we want to bless them. So if you guys, if you're parents of the students too, hey, make some more room up here, guys. You can go that way still. If you're parents of any of the students up here, just come on up. It's okay. Come on up. Lay some. Lay your hands on your on your kids, and uh, we're gonna bless these guys in just one more minute here. Pretty cool, hey. Pretty cool sight. It's pretty awesome. All right. This is looking like it's pretty much everyone. All right, church, would you guys join me this morning just stretching out your hands to these students this morning? I think there's around 80, 80 of us right now, and Malachi from Colony's got another 55 or so, so we're about 150, 160 kids going up to camp, so let's pray for these students. Lord, we just want to lift up each and every student to you right now. Going to camp, Lord, this isn't just something that we do for fun or to get away. This is something that we do to encounter you. Lord, I just ask right now that you would open the hearts in each and every student and leader that is standing in this room right now. Uh, Lord, would you give us great uh, expectations for what you're going to do, not towards the end of camp, but even tonight, on the very first day when we arrive, Lord, that you would just begin to do a great and mighty work in each and one of these students' lives. Lord, we're asking for safety. We're asking for no injuries. We're asking for uh, safe travel. We're asking for no breakdowns of the buses. We're acting, asking for all of these things, Lord, that this would just be smooth sailing all the way up. Lord, would you help us have fun? Would you help us have great memories? But most importantly, Lord, would we encounter you in a mighty, mighty way? Lord, would this be a defining moment in, in these students' lives that they can look back when they're older and said, I drew a line in the sand at this week in, at camp. I, I made the decision to follow you all the days of my life this week at camp. So Lord, as a church this morning, we stretch out our hands and we say we support them. We will lift these students up and we'll believe for great and mighty things. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. So let's load up on the buses, pick a bus, pick a bus buddy, say goodbyes, and uh, sorry for the disruption, church, but we're out of here. We'll see you guys in a week. All right, church, let's get ready to praise God again.
Christ will run my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the right. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This, this is my testimony. From death to life. Because Christ will run my story. Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. You are good. You are good. God is good, amen. Oh, Lord, we lift you. I search the world. But he couldn't feel me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along. Put me back together And every desire Now satisfied Here in your love Sing this out church Oh there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you. <laughs> oh, you are good. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain He's the God of the valley If there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Turn crazy. 
freedom this morning to just sing it out because it's here. church when I was practicing and worshiping and asking God what he wanted to do in this service and what he wanted to do for his church from out of nowhere this song just dropped in my heart and I started singing it and I started worshiping and I got the sense that God was speaking and saying hey I want to release my church this morning I want to release my church this morning. And when you, when you hear a chorus like this, you hear a song like this, you think freedom. The easiest thing to do is look to the people who have it way worse than you or who are way worse sinners than you <laughs> and point to the drug addict on the side of the street going like, that nah, is a sinner. But I just so got the sense in my spirit that, you know, whatever it is that you're frustrated with, or you're struggling with, or you're wrestling with. Maybe it's as simple as just you get too irritable. Anger. Snap. Maybe there is some substance use. Maybe you rely on alcohol to try to cope. There's no judgment here. But there is freedom here. And I just got the sense in my spirit, church, that if you want freedom from whatever, whether big or small, whatever impediment you're finding in your life, God this morning is saying, hey, I have freedom. Come to the well. I have new water for you. You don't need to live thirsty anymore. So if you can humble yourself this morning, if that means raising your hands, if that means kneeling, if that means coming to the front, or if that means finding a, a private corner to yourself, let's do some business with God this morning. Let's bring him, let's bring him our flaws, our issues, our problems. He's not threatened by them. He already knows what they are. So let's prepare our hearts as we sing this this morning. Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Let 
lift your eyes Lift your eyes to heaven There is freedom Lift your eyes Lift your eyes to heaven There is Just the voice.
I just sense that the Lord wants to bring a word so that people's ears would be open, their hearts would be open, their hearts would be soft. The Spirit of God is surely in this place today. Even as Jared spoke that word about release, I've been asking God for more release in my life so that he can use me to the potential that he wants to use me. And he wants to do that for each and every one of this, everyone that's in this place today. If you're a blood-bought child of the living God, open your ears to the Spirit of God. He says to the churches as a whole and as I, to us individually, do you hear my word? I am the word. I am Jesus. I am Jesus, the one that came to speak the word to you. His word is true. It is sure. It's forever settled in heaven. It brings life. It brings strength. It brings encouragement. It brings comfort. His word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the div dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. My heart is to be open to God because he comes to convict me because he loves me. He comes to comfort me. I want to hear the word of God. I encourage, I encourage that we can do that. His word encourages us. It brings us life like nothing else can. Thank you, Father. All to your glory, we praise you. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Is God good this morning? Is he good? Come on. You know, I was thinking about this passage of scripture. We're going to go into worship in just a, a moment again, but I was thinking about this passage of scripture, Romans chapter 12. I've shared it before, and, and this is what Paul says. He says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, let's offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is our reasonable act of worship. You know, in view of all the things, you know, I can't help but think of, even as, as Jared was singing that freedom reigns in this place, you know, I think we can all think of things that the Holy Spirit, that God has done in our lives today that, that require worship, they require gratitude on our behalf. And, and, and I think what I want to just end today, if we can, by just lifting our hands again, just worshiping the Lord. Can we do that today? Can we do that? Can we just for a couple more minutes, just lift our voices, give Him honor, give Him praise, give Him glory. Amen. Come on, let's sing today. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a light inside all we have and I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah yeah. Amen. Come on, can we give him a clap today. offering this morning?
Amen. Lord, today we worship you with, with all we have today. And Lord, today we recognize some of us in the room today, we might not feel like it's a lot, but Lord, today, whatever we have, we give to you today because you're worthy of it, Lord. You're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise today. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts today. In Jesus' name, you there, say amen. Amen. Come on, he's worthy, isn't he? He's good. Amen. Uh, as you're finding your seat, why don't you turn around, say hello to someone really quick, tell them you're glad to see them. Well, uh, if you're wondering, why is Barry wearing a hat and a shirt uh, with a cat that's riding a unicorn on it? I'm going to camp too, and I'm leaving uh, as soon as I call up our guest speaker. Uh, some of you are like, you know what, you dress like this all the time, so it's not, uh, not much different. Hey, the first thing I want to do this morning, we've forgotten to do this like the last three weeks. If you're in kindergarten or grade one to grade five, uh, you can be dismissed through uh, into the lobby, into the chapel there. Go ahead. I see a lot of you are already doing that because we forget all the time. So uh, anyways, that's good. Uh, just a, hey, we want to say just a few announcements as we transition to service today. First, we want to welcome you. Uh, if you're new or newer to our church, it's great to have you here. Uh, lots of new people here throughout the summer. Maybe you're on vacation or, you know, visiting family, camping, who knows. However you're here today, we're, we're glad that you're here. What we'd ask you to do, uh, fill out our Connect card. Maybe you're watching online today and you're new. Uh, fill out our Connect card. You can scan the link uh, or scan the QR. I'm actually feeling a little bit under the weather, so my brain feels like... <sighs> Uh, so you can scan the QR on the screen, click the link in the chat, or you can visit our info center to, uh, to get that. Uh, and if you do, someone on our team will reach out to you shortly and connect with you. We'd love to do that. Uh, just a few more things that we want to mention. Our citywide service, uh, that's coming up next week. Uh, we won't be in the building here, uh, and we won't be uh, streaming online either. So it's just an in-person. So if you want to be part of that service, you've got to be there in person at Central Park downtown. The service starts at 1030. Uh, activities, I think there's face painting. Nobody wants me to paint a face. I'll draw stick men on your face if, if that's what we have to get down to there. But uh, lots of activities going to be happening uh, next week too. I think there's going to be food trucks, all kinds of things. Uh, we still need some help with that. I think we need probably about 10 or 12 more people to help out. Uh, there's various things. Uh, face painting, I think, is actually one of them. Um, so if you're skilled in face painting, I think there's some garbage cleanup, some setup, tear down, things like that. So again, same thing. You can click the link in the chat, scan the QR on the screen. Let us know if you're able to help us with that. Uh, also, again, youth camp. If you're a parent in the room and you don't know, I think Dayton sent an email uh, this week sometime letting you know the kids are going to be back probably about 6 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, if that changes drastically, I either early or late, you can check their Instagram, or I'm sure they'll probably, the kids will have their phones back by that point. Uh, I know parents, parents are laughing because Dayton actually told them they're not allowed to have phones this week, which I love it. I love it. No phones. Hey, yes. Awesome. Dayton said no phones this week. I love it. So maybe they'll have their phones back by the time they're uh, on the bus. Or maybe you parents just didn't le even let them take them with them. That'd be even better. So uh, they're supposed to be back 6 o'clock. I uh, want to let you know, too, we're having a boxing camp here at the church. Uh, and I'm not announcing this in that if you want to come, you can come. I'm just letting you know it's, it's an outreach that we're doing through, uh, through uh, the, the connections that we have uh, with Bernard and with the community. So Yannette uh, and her team are going to be running that here at the church. I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm not sure exactly what the dates are, uh, but it's awesome. I think they have something like 35 kids register. I'm looking at Cheryl. I think you know too, right? It's something like that, 35 to 40 kids uh, register. Just an awesome opportunity uh, to reach out, to minister to those kids, many of them who do not know Jesus, some of them through the truck ministry as well. And I'm actually wondering if we can take a minute and just pray for that. Can we do that? Pray for these kids that are going to be in our building. And, and if you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me, Lord, today, thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, invite people into this building that maybe do not know you and are maybe having these connections with people that do know you uh, for maybe the first time in their life. And, and I pray that you give us the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, that we be grace, that we be pre peace, love, and joy to these kids who maybe that's not their experience at home. And Lord, I pray that we would plant seeds that produce fruit that remains in the lives of people. Lord, that there would be moments, opportunities for conversation to invite these kids into relationship with you and that we would see a harvest of souls. 
in Jesus' name. If you're ready to say amen. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, if you would, would you pray for Yannette and her team? I know it's going to be an awesome, awesome week. Uh, just two more things that we want to mention. One is our small group semester. It's coming up uh, about a, a month's time. It's going to be, sign up Sunday is going to be on the 22nd of September. Uh, I mentioned that just to say, if you uh, would consider leading a small group, I would really appreciate that. And I say me because I oversee our small group leaders. We would, but I would extra appreciate you considering leading a small group. Uh, small groups are a huge part of what we do at our church. Obviously, if you look around the room here, there's probably 350, 400 people in here, and it's impossible uh, to know everyone in the room. If you did, I'd be so impressed. But it's important for all of us in the room uh, to have relationships, close-knit relationships with people where we actually feel like we can know people and be known uh, by others, and that happens in small group settings. And so we would invite you uh, to consider doing that. And if you would, you can reach out to me. My email is btson at citylifechurch.ca, T-H-I-E-S-S-E-N at citylifechurch.ca, B, not G. You know, sometimes on the phone people say, I'll say Barry, and they're like, Gary? And I'm like, yeah, Gary. <laughs> give up. And the last thing we'll mention today is, uh, is just our giving, of course. You can uh, give in any of the usual online ways, our tithes and offerings and things like that, and Capeca as well. You can do that any of the usual online ways uh, or in person in the lobby. And I have the privilege today to invite up our guest speaker. How many of you know, don't come up yet, how many of you know Pastor James? We're clapping for him, and he hasn't even started yet. It's amazing. Uh, I was thinking about Pastor James. Of course, many of you know uh, Pastor James and Elaine. They're elders in our church. Uh, Pastor James was on staff in the church in Elaine as well for a lot of years. And I was thinking about uh, two of the things that maybe... There's a lot of things I appreciate about Pastor James, and maybe it's weird that I was going to bed last night thinking about the things that I appreciate about Pastor James, but I was. And uh, there's two things, there's many things, but two things that I appreciate about Pastor James. First was uh, his wisdom. I remember sitting in executive meetings with Pastor James, and, and I remember feeling like, okay, we're going to talk about what we think about this thing right here. And, and I would say something, and then Pastor James would say something, and I'd be like, man, that's, that's way better than what I just said. And I remember feeling like if, if I can arrive at the spot where I think the same thing as Pastor James, I feel like I will have arrived. And there were a couple times where I would, Pastor James would say something and I'd be like, man, I was thinking that too. And I'd be like, I've arrived. You know, I'm, I'm, I, Pastor James is so wise. And the second thing, and, and this is, this is uh, probably something that you would know to be true about him too. Pastor James has a deep love for the Word of God. He really does. And uh, I remember going into his office on, on many occasions, and, and I'd be, you know, going to preach in, in youth or in church, and I do this with Pastor Lauren too occasionally, go into his office and just say, hey, is, if I say this, am I, am I saying heresy or, you know, something like that? And, and Pastor James would always have an answer just to, I've always appreciated that he's always been a student of God's Word and, has, and, and carries God's Word in his heart. And I know that God's put a word in his heart to share with us today as a church. Uh, so can we give him a round of applause as he comes to, to share with us today? It's going to be awesome. Oh, you're wearing, you're wearing the headset. You don't, even, you don't even need this thing today. It's awesome. Thank you, Pastor Barry. I'm just thinking now I've got to work to bring your expectations down again. <laughs> uh, good morning. Wasn't that awesome way to start church this morning with all those young people up here? And uh, wow, that was just overwhelming. What a great group. And we'll just pray that they have an awesome time. I'm glad that Pastor Barry explained that he's going to camp because seeing him walk out would be completely devastating for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, how many enjoyed the, the beautiful rainstorm in the middle of the night? Did you wake up to the sounds and sights of thunder and lightning and pouring rain? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, um, my text this morning, I'll just uh, start out with that and then um, one thing I've learned from Pastor Barry is that you should always start with a story. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give that a go. So my text this morning is Matthew chapter 30, uh, 13, verse 47. I think it's going to pop up on the screen. There it is. Uh, and it just simply says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish 
of every kind. And uh, I entitled this this morning, um, Church is a Team Sport. Now that, hopefully that's not, you know, too irreligious to, um, you know what I mean though, it's, church isn't a sport, but I think it's a good picture. Church is a team sport. I have to admit that it's probably slightly influenced by, you know, watching a little bit of Olympics. Um, and uh, I actually didn't get to see too much of it because we um, didn't even think about it and we were off camping uh, during most of the Olympics. But I did manage to catch, um, uh, uh, when we came home, uh, some of the, cl um, the last uh, few days of it. And I love as a lot of people, I enjoy sports, and I really do love track and field. Uh, and so Olympics is probably the only time to, that I ever watch uh, track and field events. And, and there's just something about that. I, 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 for me personally, my track career uh, peaked in 1966 at the ripe old age of 11 years old. Um, and I was in grade seven at Nakasero Primary School in Kampala, Uganda. And uh, the fun part is that there's a few of you that have actually seen my school. Uh, and uh, so you can kind of picture that right now. But there I was in grade seven. And um, now at my school in Nakasero, uh, Whenever anybody came to school or a family came to school, they were immediately, as part of their uh, registration, they were placed into one of four teams uh, because the, there was just competition riddled throughout the school. It probably isn't that way in school now. I think, is it true that competition isn't considered good for kids anymore? I don't know. I, I'm not sure about that. But uh, back then, we thrived on competition. And, and uh, so uh, there were four teams. There was um, the red team, which was called, these were all, and they were named after um, East African explorers. Uh, the red team was the uh, Speak. Uh, the green team was Stanley. The yellow team was portal, and the blue team was Livingstone. And uh, so my family, when we arrived, us three kids, we were placed into the blue team, the Livingstone team. And that becomes uh, your team uh, throughout the whole, your whole school career there. And so um, there was competitions, there was academic competitions. I can't say I remember too much about those, but uh, there was sports competitions. We played uh, football, soccer for you guys, um, and uh, different types of team sports, sometimes, sometimes field hockey, but the, the event of the year, sort of the pinnacle of the year, was sports day, which was really a track and field day, and, and for us, that was the Olympics. It was like, um, it was like the just the time when, uh, the, the most important time of the year. And we prepped for it, we worked hard, we prepared for it. So here I was in 1966, uh, grade seven. By now, I was actually the captain of the blue team of the Livingstone House. And uh, so this was my day because I was, I was, I was pretty good at track, um, a few field events as well, but uh, running was my deal, uh, especially the short runs, the sprints. Um, that was my deal. So this was my day to uh, not only lead the living stone to a, a, an amazing day, but also to pick up a few uh, first place. We didn't have medals. They were actually ribbons. Um, a few fir first place ribbons myself. Now, wouldn't you know it, that year, my grade seven year, I was definitely the fastest in the school at the start of the year um, because there was lots of competition throughout the year. So I was definitely the fastest at the 100 yard dash and so I was pretty confident. Wouldn't you know it, that close to the beginning of that school year, a couple of guys dropped into the school. These were, um, Nakasero um, at that time was a school that was mostly expatriate, expatriate kids. Um, so back in the 60s, a lot of, uh, a lot of Europeans, mostly British. Um, by this time, there was a few, um, it, was, it was 
It was shifting a little bit. And these two young guys were um, sons of an, an ambassador, as my memory goes, from I think somewhere in West Africa. I can't remember the country. But I'll tell you what, these guys were fast. One of them was in grade seven, and one of them was in grade six. And they could outrun me. I had no chance. And I just remember just thinking about sports day and thinking, oh my goodness, I've lost. Uh, you know, what, what I thought I had, I've lost. And true enough, as sports day came, uh, when it came to the 100 yard dash, I was a distant third. But you know, the, the pinnacle of the sports day, of the, of the track events, the pinnacle, the last event, and sort of like the highlight, was the 4 by 110. It was in yards back then. The 4 by 110 boys relay. And so I remember, um, you know, in prepping for it, in preparing for it, I remember thinking, uh, because, you know, we... We, pra we practiced enough, there was enough heats, there was enough uh, trial races and stuff that I absolutely knew that our Livingstone Four, the four of us guys in my team, we had absolutely no chance now against the yellow team with these two uh, new guys that could outrun us all. And uh, so I don't know if it was our coach because we had a coach, one of the teachers, or if it was my idea, probably it was the coach's idea, but it came to us that the only way that we had a chance was to become the absolute best at passing the baton. And the, uh, to, to be absolutely perfect at that if we had any chance. So that's what we did. We, uh, we, we, we did all kinds of practice. We, we did a lot of secret practice because we didn't want the other teams to realize that we were actually working on our transitions. I, I kind of remember that in some kind of like um, heats or practice runs, just sort of we, we did challenge the yellow team to, uh, to the relay before sports day. And I do remember kind of telling our team, let's just let them whip us. So there might have been a little bit of head games as well. I'm not sure. But, but the main thing we were doing is we were on the sly. We were just practice, 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 working on our transitions, working on our transitions um, so that we actually could run the relay and do the transitions without the tiniest little bit of a slowdown or any kind of chance of dropping the baton or doing anything that would ruin the race for us. So that was our strategy. So come sports day, and uh, like I said, I was third in the 100-yard dash, um, no chance at all. But when it came to the relay, this was our moment. And I remember um, our starter, he got us started. And I think that one of the new guys was their starter, and they were well ahead. And, and I was the anchor on our team. And, of course, their fastest guy was the anchor on the yellow team. And as they went around the track, it was a a 220 track, a half track, and so it's twice around. Uh, you know, uh, at one point, I can't remember which transition, but wouldn't you know it, they dropped the baton and uh, allowed the blue team to get well ahead. So as the third guy was coming around the track and I was waiting for it, he had a pretty decent lead because uh, they, had, uh, they had messed up. And uh, so he passed me the baton with probably a good 20 yards of, of lead and I just ran like crazy. As we came around the last corner, I could see the yellow team, the guy, their, their anchor, uh, catching up because he was faster and he was getting closer and closer and closer but somehow I managed to hang in there. But the point is, it was our transitions. It was that team aspect, that connection that, uh, that we perfected and we ended up being able to win when we really shouldn't have because we definitely weren't the fastest team. And you know, I thought of that story um, uh, because that actually is kind of, maybe not quite that dramatic, but that's really how our Canadian men's team won this year. Um, if, you, if you did watch it, none of our four runners were having a tremendous individual Olympics, but because of 
they were definitely the best at the transitions and managed to uh, eke out a gold for, uh, for Canada. Anyway, uh, now Barry's stories always connect to what he's going to say, so I'm hoping that this one does too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that church is a team sport. Now, this, uh, this verse that we're looking at today, it's actually uh, Matthew chapter 13 uh, records several uh, short parables that Jesus uh, used to describe and illustrate the kingdom of heaven. That's what a parable is. A parable is simply an illustration. It's from the Greek word parabosis, I think, which just simply means comparison. So Jesus, as you know, that those of you that have read, and I'm sure most of you had uh, uh, the gospel stories of Jesus, and he was constantly taking ordinary things and just things that they would be uh, familiar with and then using those as illustrations. Obviously, no one story or parable uh, creates this perfect picture. So Jesus was very good at using uh, different things to, to build in and to, uh, to create these pictures. And so in Matthew 13, we have um, odds are he didn't say all these at one time, but Matthew, uh, as a writer, he basically collected all these uh, stories, these parables that Jesus used to describe the kingdom of God and put them together for us. And this is one of them. Um, the the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Jesus talked a lot. In fact, you could probably say that um, maybe the dominant theme or certainly one of the dominant themes of, of uh, Jesus was uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Actually, those terms are uh, almost definitely synonymous. There's no difference, so don't be confused. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it means the same thing. Uh, d different writers use different, used either term uh, completely um, synonymously. So Jesus, uh, his primary message was actually announcing the kingdom. And the reality is, is that the, uh, the announcement of the kingdom is actually the climax of the gospel. That is the gospel. <laughs> the gospel really in its climax is there is a new king in town and his name is Jesus. Amen? How many have ever heard that Jesus is king? He's the king of the universe. And so when Jesus came uh, proclaiming the gospel, he was really proclaiming that God's eternal kingdom had come, and here is the king. And uh, so the kingdom of God is, is really the realm where Jesus Christ reigns as king, and God's authority is supreme. It's not a place, <laughs> it's not a territory, it's not an earthly kingdom, but it's a realm where God's uh, authority is recognized and is supreme. And Jesus came and he says, the kingdom of God is among you. It's come, and I'm the king. And he invited people to uh, come and recognize him as the kingdom, uh, as, as the king of the kingdom. Um, now, when you take this idea of a net, Okay, so I've got a picture of, of a fishing net that Jesus is talking about. Maybe you can throw it up there, and I can see I'm going to have to hurry, so be ready. Do you see that picture? Um, here it comes. Any moment. Is it there? No, oh, it's not on that one yet. Oh, there it is. Okay, so... Yeah, you probably can picture this, but that's really what Jesus was talking about. And of course, he was beside the Sea of Galilee a lot. Uh, so really, a net is simply that. And uh, um, there's another picture of a net as well, just kind of throwing it in the lake. But that's really what, what they did. That was the primary way that they fished. We, in Chilliwack, we think of, when we think of fishing, we at least I do. I picture the guys out on the Better River throwing, you know, throwing the Chilliwack River, throwing out their um, whatever it is, the line, and uh, reeling it in. Um, but when Jesus was talking about fishing, this is what he was talking about, the net. And it, uh, so the purpose of that was obviously to, to gather net. Now, um, w metaphorically, we use the term network as well, which really is um, a, a, a net 
uh, is held together by secure connections and a set of interlinking lines resembling a net. An internet, interconnected system is a network. And it seems like Paul uh, kind of picked up on this idea a little bit. I'm just going to read one quick scripture, Ephesians chapter 4. Most of you be somewhat familiar with this. Uh, and Paul's clearly talking about the church here. And specifically, uh, he moves into the talking about the local church. It says in verse, starting at verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, um, rather, oh, jumping down to 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we gr are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16 primarily here, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which it, uh, every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So a picture of the church, the local church, I think, as this idea of a net. So we could say that Jesus was picturing here the local church as a net that is thrown into the water and gathers all kinds of fish. So that's my uh, premise uh, this morning. And I just want to take a quick look at three lessons from this picture, this metaphor of a fishing net and thinking about us, thinking about the local church. So first of all, the purpose of the net is to gather fish. That's profound, isn't it? But that's the purpose of the net, is to gather fish. And, uh, of course, fish, uh, through most of the Bible, is a picture of people. And uh, we see that, of course, we, we, um, we, probably our minds would quickly go to when Jesus called some of the disciples who were fishermen. What did he say? He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Um, there's one great scripture in, found in Ezekiel chapter 47, which is a prophetic picture of, of, um, of the kingdom, of the church, and, and picturing it as a, a, a river uh, flowing out from uh, the temple of God. And, uh, and then uh, in, in about verse 9 and 10, it says that uh, along the side of this uh, river, there will be places for uh, uh, for spreading nets, and the picture is, again, uh, people being gathered into this, um, this net. So a primary focus for Jesus is fishing for people. Uh, Jesus uh, pictured people as uh, fish in the sea of the world, uh, waiting to be gathered into his kingdom. So... This is a very profound statement, but church is about people. <laughs> church is about people. Take a quick look without, without go, uh, get moving anywhere. Just look around you this morning, and uh, what do you see? You see people, and uh, that's what church is about. Church is about people, and uh, you know, the, what, what I love as I was reading this is it says that uh, this, this picture that Jesus painted, uh, he says that, that this it, the kingdom of God is like a net that was uh, thrown into the water and gathered fish of every kind. Isn't that beautiful? Fish of every kind. You know, church is for every kind. <laughs> every kind of people. And I just love that. It's, it's young. It's old. Uh, it's the people that uh, from different uh, economic backgrounds. Even people of different political leanings. Wow, can you imagine that? Whoa, that's scary, especially in that country down south of us. That's really scary down there. Uh, but that's the reality. When you think about the people that Jesus immediately gathered, oh my goodness sakes, they had a guy who was called a zealot. Wow, that would be really extreme on the political realm, uh, trained to kill the Romans. And then you had a guy that actually wrote this, or recorded this, Matthew, on the opposite end of the political realm who actually was working for the Romans. Can you imagine Jesus intentionally getting those two people together? Uh, do you think he didn't expect some uh, tension? <laughs> he knew there was going to be tension. I can just imagine the arguments and the, uh, just the, that working things out. 
as the kingdom of God because the kingdom is about, the church is about people of every kind. What I love about, um, shall I say this? Would this be okay to say? It, it feels good to me that our church is not only diverse in so many ways, but it's becoming increasingly ethnically diverse. I just love that. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, it's, I think a, a healthy church reflects the changing community that it's in. And as we see Chilliwack change, we want our church to reflect that and to change and to become uh, uh, truly a place that gathers people of every kind. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Awesome. Great picture. I love it anyway. Um, all right, number two. Uh, the second thing is an effective net has, is made up of strong cords, those strings that make the net. They better be strong. They better not be too frayed. <laughs> uh, so strong cords. And that, that's a great uh, picture, I think, of individuals, individuals who are uh, growing strong <laughs> spiritually, growing spiritual in, in faith and in, uh, in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Bible perspective of, of, uh, of, of, of growth and strength uh, spiritually is, is probably made up of two words, transformation and formation. I think transformation uh, speaks to that uh, conversion process. It begins with conversion. We actually, uh, at, 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 when we come into, when we're gathered in the church, there needs to be a point in time when we are actually converted. That simply means uh, changed. We, we convert. We go from uh, our own way. I'm the king of my own life. <laughs> I do what I please. To accepting Jesus as king in my life. He's my savior and he's my Lord and I'm on his team. I'm part of uh, what he's doing and my life is now about him. That's conversion. Uh, Paul put it this way, a familiar scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old has passed away, behold, the new has come. It's a new way of life with Jesus as the King and as the Lord, and we're endeavoring to follow Him. Then the second part of, of growth or strength is that term formation, which is uh, so critical. It may not be used in our, um, I don't think it's used too much in the Scripture, but it describes this continual process of allowing Christ to be formed in us as we continue in faith live a life of allegiance to Jesus as king, we grow more and more like the one that we look to, the one that we worship, Jesus the Christ, God's eternal king. So that's formation. Scriptures on that, just real quick here. Galatians 4.19 says, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. <laughs> and they will continue, Paul says, until Christ is fully formed in your lives. How many know that that's really the track we're on, is this process of allowing Jesus to become more and more a part of, his li of our life so that we become more and more like him. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, 19 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Isn't that powerful? What a purpose that we have as fish that have been gathered in the kingdom, in the church. That's our purpose, is to grow and become more and more like the king. All right. So really, you could say that this process that we commit to, <laughs> uh, it's really a process of sin, shriveling, and the fruit of the Spirit growing. Take that picture in. Sin really describes that self of us, that self-focus. Me, 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 me. What's in it for me? 
what's the best for me? That really is the essence of our sin. What makes me feel good? But the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says, is love. Love expressed as joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Right, number three. Number three, just looking at the, this picture of the net, an effective net depends on strong knots or strong connections. <laughs> you can have strong strands of rope or whatever makes up the net, but if they're not strongly connected to the other strands, the net becomes ineffective. What a beautiful picture of the church. Strong connections that join us together. Uh, so the effectiveness of the net depends on the strength and the robustness of the connections. The scripture of Paul also speaks about, again, pictures this. Uh, Colossians 2 verse 2 is uh, one where he says this. He says that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. Knit together knit together, bound together. <clears throat> that speaks of growing together, growing together. We read part of that scripture. I'll just read the whole thing. That their hearts may be encouraged, Colossians 2, 2, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full insur assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge one that we probably have heard most of us, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, uh, the writer, presumably Paul, not sure, says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. Can I say that there's huge value in being together? <laughs> and it's not just about the group coming together, but of course it's premised upon that perspective that to be an effective net in the water of Chilliwack, the tighter our connections as a people, the more effective we become. Growing individuals with growing strong connections. What a great picture of the church. You know, um, there's been a couple of times that I've probably really, that I, that, well, when I think of uh, this value of together, I remember when we moved across the country with our family of, uh, well, six of us, Elaine and I, dragging the four kids with us, by this point, teenagers. We got to Surrey. We just didn't feel like that was home at all. It wasn't working out. And uh, we quickly, um, very soon, realized that hmm, we would rather be in Chilliwack. But by that point, we were kind of tied in with Elise and kids in school, et cetera, for the year in, um, in uh, Surrey. But we felt disconnected and certainly from uh, the church. There just didn't seem to be any connection points there, especially for the kids. And uh, so we started coming out here. And I remember a very intentional conversation we, we, um, between Elaine and I. And we just knew that we could not afford to just kind of be lackadaisical about church for whatever was left of the year, about nine months before we could move. So we, we made the commitment that we're going to be in this church right here, Chilliwack Church, while we were living in Surrey, every single Sunday morning. And so we drove out every single Sunday. I don't remember missing one. There might have been one or two. I have no idea. But we just knew that in order to um, have that example to our kids, it wasn't about, will I backslide? Uh, no, that really wasn't the question, but it was more in that particular case, it was about uh, maintaining that consistency uh, that because we were building a family. And uh, so to us, that was worth 
getting up in the morning, driving to Chilliwack, being in church, making sure that our kids could be in youth. We even came out sometimes on uh, youth nights all the way out with the kids uh, because that was important to us. We recognized it. Um, the other time that came to mind was, and of course we've, we've all just experienced this together and it seems to keep coming up, was the whole COVID experience. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as we all know, we, we, we didn't come together. And um, I remember when, and when it first happened, I was thinking, wow, this could actually be for two or three weeks. That's going to be radical. Well, it turned out to be more like, I can't remember, 18 months or something. But, um, you know, we kind of got used to, we knew, of course we all knew it was temporary, so it wasn't like it was a life sentence or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, we probably experienced it differently. But I do remember um, for myself, because, you see, I, I'm actually an introvert, um, very much so, uh, very classic. And so, to be honest, I was quite comfortable doing church in my living room. I really was. And, uh, you know, probably some of you were uh, just highly motivated to come back together. But I'm just being honest. I wasn't all that motivated. It was, I was having, it was okay. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't about, was I going to lose my faith? No, not really. I'm, but I did begin to notice that there was some element of passion that I was, miss that I was, starting, to, that was starting to slide. And uh, even when church reopened, to be, again, it was something that I did out of habit. I, it, I did because I've always done that. But I did notice after about 18 months of, you know, worshiping on the couch. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe you all experienced the same thing, I don't know, but, you know, the first while, you know, we got up in our living room and, you know, but after a while, we weren't doing that. Maybe, maybe the spiritual ones among us were, but, uh, and, uh, you know, I did notice that when we started gathering, that that passion that used to be wasn't actually there, and I actually had to regain that. You know, there's something about the gathering together which keeps the passion of worship, the passion of the intensity of our, of our spiritual uh, direction, it keeps it intact. It's important being together. You know, I, I, and, and you know, this... This came to me last week, Pastor Lauren was preaching, and um, I can't remember uh, from Psalm 27, and of course there is uh, that idea of passion for the house, and I think that was one of his points. And it came to me, based upon my experience, that a barometer, not the, but a barometer of our spiritual life could be the passion that we have for the gathering of God's people chew on that one a wee bit. But again, it goes against my personality. Within me, I don't need you. I'm good by myself. Maybe my wife a bit too, but hey, you know. <laughs> but the reality is, no matter what your personality trait is, all kinds, remember all kinds of people, extroverts, introverts as well, we need the gathering together. Amen? Because it's those strong connections that allow us to be the net. All right. Growing together. Intentional unity. I'm flying now. Intentional unity. Did you know that, that concept of unity? The unity is that state of being in agreement and working together. That state of being joined together to form one unit. There's intentionality about that. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> It doesn't just happen because we get saved, we come to Christ. It happens intentionally. And then, I'm skipping here, we're building the team together. Building the team together. Strong connection of activity, keeping focused on uh, the unifying mission. Here's some great quotes about this idea of team. Remember, church is a team sport. That's what I started with, right? So this is where I hope it connects with my relay team experience. Uh, winning the race, not because we were the best runners, the fastest, but because 
we had the best connections, the best transitions. We worked on that, and, uh, and that was where we excelled. Um, uh, Vince Lombardi, you probably recognize the name. I think he's a famous football coach, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> anyway, he said, individual commitment, this is team, individual commitment to a group effort, that is what makes a team work. A guy by the name of Phil Jackson, who I don't know, said this, the strength of a team is each individual member, strong chords, the strength of each member is the team, the connection. Henry Ford said this, team coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Ephesians 4, 16 that we read early, Paul said, describing the church by which every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. And he says it results in growth. Now, just as we close, um, that metaphor of the fishing net it's hard to leave that without recognizing that the net that they were using was under a lot of strain. And they would catch their fish, and it would be stretched and pulled. Uh, there were probably rocks maybe on the shore as they pulled it in that maybe ripped the net. But the reality is the nets got ripped. I've got a picture of, of a net that got ripped. And uh, it's interesting that within the gospel record, has that picture come up yet? Okay, there it is, you see? There they are. And within the gospel record, we have uh, accounts um, that, uh, of them having these fishermen actually mending their nets. Mark chapter 1, verse 19, it says, going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Uh, they were fishermen, you know them, uh, who were in their boats mending their nets. And uh, so it seems to me that a significant part of the job, the role of a fisherman back in those days using their nets, was actually not just being out there enjoying catching fish and eating the fish or whatever, uh, but was actually mending their nets, making sure the nets were clean and the nets were in good shape, mending the nets. You know, Jesus said this. He said offenses will come. <laughs> so there are things that will tend to rip the net. There's things that tear the cords. Maybe uh, that's personal. Maybe there's things in your life which uh, come against you and, and weaken that spiritual direction that you have. But there's certainly, within the context of the church, there are lots of opportunity for the knots to come apart, for connections to be broken for the nets to get ripped, rendering the collective less effective, the net less, less uh, effective. I think that uh, the challenge this morning that I want to kind of leave with you is that we get the opportunity of choosing to be a net mender, <laughs> a net mender. It's possible to actually be one of those net rippers, but I don't think that's a very noble uh, perspective. But I believe that we all have the opportunity, and we see it through the New Testament, of actually being a net mender, one that actually strengthens the connections um, of the net. There's a great scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, and says this. I don't think it's on the screen. Uh, it says this, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourself together with, in peace. So net rippers, we could probably think about what those are, but obviously uh, wear and tear for the fishermen. Uh, maybe there was actually fish that had teeth, I don't know, and, and sort of bit through the, I don't have no idea. But uh, uh, when you put it in our perspective, criticisms, self-focus, thinking about ourselves, offenses, pride is a big one. But you know what another big one is, is apathy. Apathy weakens the net. Um, 
our job individually. We should uh, be a net mender. Um, as we close, it's time. Uh, the, um, the New Testament is filled with these exhortations of essentially being net menders, of taking responsibility for the net. And uh, here's what I'd like you to do this morning is maybe would you join me and just stand up this morning as we close and um, just take a look around the room. Uh, now, if you all, you know, turn around, then you'll be looking at the back of most people's heads. But so kind of like don't all do it once, don't all go the same way. But this is the net called City Life Church. <laughs> and uh, as you do that this morning, I'm just going to read some of these uh, New Testament exhortations. The scripture says, love one another. Take a look around. Come on. You can look around. Uh, you don't have to be looking at me. Smile. Wave at people. Do whatever you want. Um, yeah. Be devoted to one another, it says. Honor one another above yourself. Wow. That's the opposite of pride. Listen to this one. Live in harmony with one another. Come on, you're not looking at the other parts of the net here. <laughs> you're looking at me, which is nice, but yeah. <laughs> That's uncomfortable, right? Build one another up. Wow, accept one another. Accept one another. Serve one another. All right, here's a tough one sometimes. Forgive one another. Forgive one another. Here's one some of you are really, really, really good at. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Submit to one another. Amen? Did you look around and see the people that are part of the net? <laughs> Some of them you would naturally be gravi you would just naturally connect with. Others probably not so much, but the net, our role, our job, our, our uh, a priority is to be strong as individuals but also to build strong connections as a net. As we close, there's one passage that I'm going to throw, get them to throw up on the screen. And what I'd like to do is read it together. It's, it's just a powerful, um, and, and you see this sort of emphasis all the way through the New Testament writings. Clearly, the New Testament writers, a huge perspective, a huge emphasis was the local church and this idea of the strength of of the church is the connections, is us as individuals being motivated and prioritizing being together with the right attitudes towards each other. So from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, it's up on the screen. Let's just read it nice and slow um, and together. It says, put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also must, must forgive. You must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm not going to tell you to be seated because that's...
not really required. Um, the word that actually came to my mind as, as he was going through the entire um, sermon today was intentionality, and I think we're all called to be intentional people, to grow together that, that link. And you have to be purposeful with the links, right? You can't have the links so far apart because the fish will just go right through it, right? Um, I'm not preaching. Don't worry. Uh, but I want to thank you all for coming today. What a great word. Let's give Pastor James one more round of applause. And as he talked today about the mending of the nets, we're going to have a team up here to pray with you. So if you're walking through a, a tough season, you're looking for the body to help mend these broken areas of your life, we're going to have a team up here right after the service. Uh, please do not forget, next week we are meeting at the park. Everyone say 1030. That is the time the service starts. It doesn't start at 10. Uh, there will be shuttle service can't remember who told me that, from the Alliance Church. So if you don't want to look for parking down around the park area, you can park there. They'll have a shuttle back and forth. Otherwise, you can find parking around the park there. Uh, but thank you. Thank you all for coming today. We love you. We look forward to seeing you next week at the park. We will be taking the chairs down, up, however you want to say it. Um, so if you could help us with that, that would be great. And yeah, let's spend time together. Don't rush out of here. We love you, and we'll see you next week at the park. God bless.